early this year a book appeared which is very devoted to individual liberty and very libertarian in its allegiance so that inevitably it invited comparison with Rand's book Atlas Shrugged. It was published by a virtually unknown publisher, Accurate Press, in St. Louis. <clears throat> and as far as I know, it hasn't had any fanfare. Uh, I bought the book through ISIL. I checked a number of bookstores in Los Angeles. Not only did they not have it, they didn't have it on their list of new or forthcoming books. Uh, as far as they were concerned, it didn't exist. Um, and yet it impressed me a good deal when I read it. The author, John Ross, uh, St. Louis, is very aware of the significance of his theme. He says, in a sentence in the introduction, he says, <clears throat> he gives a whole bunch of historical parallels of uh, legislative acts that were supposed to have great consequences and had unintended bad consequences. His examples of the initiation of World War I and the um, uh, Versailles Treaty, a whole bunch of things. And he says, <clears throat> today in America, honest, successful, productive people are once again being stripped of their freedom and their dignity and having their noses rubbed in it. The conflict has been building for over half a century and once again, warning flags are frantically waving while <clears throat> the instigators rush headlong toward the abyss and their own doom. It is my hope that these people will stop and reverse their course before they reach the point where such reversal is no longer possible. Um, now, <clears throat> that could well have been an introductory statement for Atlas Shrugged as well. However, let a few points of comparison. Both novels have somewhat similar themes. Atlas, of course, is an extended argument for freedom and especially a free economy. So is unintended consequences, but its special focus is the gun laws and the gun culture. Both novels are quite long. Atlas is a little over 100, 1,100 pages long, and Unintended Consequences has about 900. I take it he took the name from Hayek, although I don't think it was actually original with Hayek either. Anyway, both novels have interlocking plots uh, of some complexity. Uh, Atlas, as you know, is a... <clears throat> Uh, has a number of plots going at the same time, but they all feed into each other, and that's roughly true of this one also. It's a little bit off-putting at the beginning. You have a couple of hundred pages in which you get acquainted with one set of characters, and then you get another set of characters. After all, the thing begins in 1906, though most of it is today, and uh, you don't exactly know where you are, though it's it, it all has a definite goal. It, wait a little bit, and it all makes sense but it doesn't necessarily do so immediately. Um, both novels have fascinating characters, but in both cases, the characters are more mouthpieces of ideas than characters in their own right. I think it's fair to say that that's true of Atlas. There are a few characters that live and breathe on their own, like Reardon, but for the most part, the characters are symbols of ideas, and that's why they're having such a tough time uh, getting a script for the movie of Atlas Shrugged because they don't know exactly what words to put into the mouths of the characters. Nothing seems natural. Uh, and the same is true here. There's one main character in Unintended Consequences named Henry Bowman who <coughs> uh, is groomed throughout the first part of the, of the book and who uh, is the main character for the remainder of it. Uh, and uh, but even that character is not exactly what you'd call three-dimensional. Uh, not even quite as three-dimensional a character as Reardon was in, in Atlas. Uh, I think even in Atlas, although it, the, you know, it, it's a tremendous book, as far as characterization is concerned, I don't see any f such 
full-fledged characterization as you have in, for instance, Rand's favorite novelist, Victor Hugo, or in her favorite 20th century novelist, Joseph Conrad, whom I, with whom I discussed uh, uh, many things, I mean, with, with Rand, not with Conrad. Uh, so, uh, a couple of other brief points of comparison. There's quite a few scenes of passion and sex in both novels, but the sex in unintended consequences is a lot raunchier than it is in Atlas, and the language used is such as Rand herself would, would never use in her books. Uh, but both novels contain, and this is the most important feature, powerful and eloquent speeches, which go on for quite some time, but are really riveting. Uh, Francisco's speech about money is paralleled by the number of other distinguished speeches that occurs in Ross's book. Uh, moreover, in Ross's book, we're tremendously involved in the affairs of today. Uh, there are, uh, there's a, a passage <coughs> on Vincent Foster, for example. Uh, there, both the Branch Davidians and the people on Ruby Ridge appear very briefly as characters in the novel. I mean, so there's, there's no doubt about its contemporary impact. I'm going to read a few passages and then make some general comments and go into my main theme, which is the ethics of revenge, which is, it seems to me, the primary motif uh, uh, of, of this book. Maybe not the primary motif, but the primary motif is, has to do with getting the government out of the gun business, uh, and a little more widely than that, though that's the main thing. All right. Now... I can't give you the flavor of this by describing it. I have to give you a few passages. Um, in one scene, uh, a friend of the main character, Henry, is returning, he's a lawyer, returning from South Africa after 30 years. And he has a lot of guns and other things to bring back. And to his great surprise, he hasn't been in the US for 30 years and now all his guns are all impounded on uh, their contraband. Even though they're his, he ha can't prove that he bought them 30 years ago. One of them has a little ivory tip. Ivory's prohibited. That makes it contraband, and everything gets cons confiscated. And that's just the beginning of a number of similar things. I mean, the, the, just the nuisance of, of laws. Uh, now, <clears throat> one or two passages. Do not hope says Henry to the returning South African, do not hope that police officers will resign instead of carrying out the orders that they dislike. They will not. The state police did not resign 30 years ago. Instead, they used gas, billy clubs, and German shepherds on civil rights marchers. Federal police in Waco last year did not resign. Instead, they used machine guns and tanks on a group of people they suspected had not paid a $200 tax and they burned all 86 of them alive. In Los Angeles, St. Louis, and Chicago, the police are not resigning. Instead, they are conducting warfare <coughs> in public housing projects. They are seizing guns that have not been stolen. They are seizing them from people who do not have criminal records, um, and so on. The so-called crime bill contains a, a measure to hire thousands of Hong Kong police. Why? because these officers are already highly trained in confiscating arms from Chinese and they won't resign uh, when they're uh, ordered to confiscate uh, material. And a number of other data, some of which was, had been unfamiliar to me, a lot of this. And uh, the returning American from South Africa says, why, why? And Henry says, well, uh, cheer up. He says, socialism's dying all over the world but Washington just wants to give it one more try. <laughs> I hope it doesn't kill him first, said Henry. This is a slight uh, foretaste of things to come. A couple of other passages to give some idea of how this idea, uh, how it proceeds. My grandfather, said Henry, grew up in a farming family at the end of the last century. His family never got a nickel from the government, which I know is exactly the way he thought it should be. 
He worked his way through college and law school and saved through his earnings from his law work. In the 20s, a man came to him who had designed a better plow disc. Compare this with some passages in Atlas. He was looking for backers. Grandpa knew something about plowing, so he watched the man demonstrate his design and helped him get the financing. Some of the money came from Grandpa's savings, enough to where he owned about a seventh of this startup business. Then came the crash in 29, and they were still in the black, and they had no debt, and since they were a private firm, no one had bought stock on 10% margin or gotten caught in a short squeeze. And the big agricultural products companies were all being hit by this raft of farm foreclosures, and they took notice of this private company that was still enjoying decent sales and making money. And it turns out, what was the name of that company? It was the John Deere Company. Now John Deere, after they paid all their corporate tax, and they almost always declare a chunk of what's left afterwards, guess what? The money got taxed again. Then he goes through a long litany of the various taxes on almost every asset that is being, uh, 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 that the man has. Uh, so in the end, there's really very little left. So he concludes, I figured it out a year ago, says Henry. I totaled up the taxes I paid to date on earned income. Not, didn't count those on dividends or interest. The total was six times the taxes on all the sources of income paid by the president of this country and his wife added together. I've never lied about my income or knowingly wronged any person. And you know something? I've paid every one of those taxes without complaint, even when the president announced that people like me weren't paying our fair share. I've been a damn good sport, and you'd think the government would leave me alone to make money so that they could continue to take half of it. But instead, they pick on the one thing I really like to do, something that's a fundamental right supposedly secured by our Constitution, and they do everything they can to take that away from me. Henry shook his head, and Ray suspected that his friend was not quite finished. I've never said this out loud, but you know all those hours I've spent developing my shooting skills, and all the money I've spent on ammunition and club membership and my private range here, and all the time I've spent training other people to protect themselves, including lots of women in police department, always for free, I think the government ought to say, hey, Henry Bowman, good job. We want people to be skilled. We want them to be safe with guns. We want them to be able to protect themselves from harm. We want everyone to be self-reliant. We wish we had more people like you with good gun skills and a lifetime of experience to pass along to others. Keep up the good work. But instead, they have treated me and others like me with utter contempt. They have confiscated our property and put people like me in maps maximum security prisons over ownership of offender washers or claiming that they were unassembled silencer parts or pieces of muffler tubing. They haven't shot a man's, they have shot a man's wife in the head because his gun's buttstock was too short. They beat another man's pregnant wife until she miscarried over a gun collection on which the guy had done all the stupid paperwork and the things the ATF wanted. They burned 90 people alive over a disputed $200 tax. If you believe you have the right to buy, own, and shoot small arms in a safe manner as much and as often as you can, and you exercise this right regularly, our government has branded you as the enemy. They will pursue you more relentlessly and attack you more severely than they do the people who pick up teenage runaways in the bus station and torture them to death on camera for black market snuff films. These status thugs are zeroing in on the most important thing in my life, being able to exercise my right to buy guns and shoot them is more valuable to me than all the millions of mine that they have taken. What you are describing is much worse than anything I saw in South Africa, said Ray. Ray stared at his friend and his mind went blank when he said there was nothing he could do about it. Sixteen years ago, he said to himself, I watched this man face down a stampede of buffalo with a bolt-action rifle because he thought the herd was going to trample one of my trackers, and he did it with a smile. Now he feels beaten by his own government. Well, when you get to where you start shooting them, Give me a call. Jesus, where did that thought come from, he said. And <clears throat> that's, all right, I'm almost finished with that part.
gradually the idea of what to be done is to be done about it germinates in his mind. Okay, one more quick item. We think the culture is important and we're willing to pay for our part of it. The people in the gum culture have above average educations, above average incomes, almost non-existent criminal involvement. We in the gun culture offer to buy the government surplus guns and instead they have them cut up. The people in the gun culture have a better safety record than any police department in the nation, but several states actually prohibit us from using gun, guns even for self-protection. We in the gun culture played by their rules. But if they even suspect we've ignored a $200 tax process altogether on the guns that, where the wood and the steel is too long or a little bit too short, they'll spend over a million dollars watching us for months and then they'll shoot our wives and children or burn us alive. And when the public gets outraged by these actions, the government issues letters of reprimand and sends the guys who did the killing on paid leave. In the decades that the feds have been raiding and killing people in the gun culture over suspected non-payment of $200 taxes, not one federal agent has been fined a single dollar or spent even one night in jail. Fleming stopped for a moment and took another drink. Are you <clears throat> and you know something else that's never happened? To this day, not a single person in the gun culture has dropped the hammer on one of these feds. Not once. Then after these status bastards have done all these things, they grin and tell us how they like to hunt ducks and how the only laws that they want to pass are reasonable laws. I know, said Ray, everything you say is true. I still can't quite believe it. What do you think is going to happen? One of two things, Fleming said with a sigh. One of the political parties is going to wake up, smell the coffee, and start restoring and reaffirming all the articles in the Bill of Rights, the Second, Fourth, Fifth, Tenth Amendments, and if that doesn't happen, said Ray gently. He took several moments before he spoke, although it was obvious he knew exactly what he was going to say. Then, he said, we're going to have a civil war. Now, the latter part of the book is about this war. I don't, I can't go into detail about it. I want to just make a few comments on it. They're not at first clear what to do. What can they do? Usually, one takes the lawful route, but here it is the law itself that's corrupt. So what can they do to correct the situation? What you're telling me, Ray, is, see that guy over there waiting for the bus? The one wearing the suit, a little more wrinkled than yours? Yeah, that's the one. He's an ATF agent. Last week, he inspected the inventory of a local gun store. He found a single shot 22 with a 16 and a half inch barrel, and he looked at it close and saw it was a smooth bore made for a 22 shot long, and he called his supervisor. 16 inches is the limit for rifles, and so on. Illegal possession. Store owner and his employees are now in jail, trying to raise $250,000 bond, charged with violating the National Firearms Act conspiracy to violate fi fire firearms laws, violating RICO. The entire contents of the store, as well as the building itself, have been seized under the new forfeiture laws. The agent's about to go to the bank's parking garage now. What do you do with him? I say, pop him in the back of the head with a 22 when he fiddles with his car keys, and then just walk away. All right. That turns out, gradually, to be the preferred solution in this novel. And I want to discuss that briefly. I'm first going to compare this with a couple of other works. In the novel, uh, the main character starts out by uh, he doesn't mean he wants to get even. He doesn't know exactly how to go about it, but he's trapped on his property by some federal agents and law enforcers. And so in self-defense, he kills them, uh, and uh, word gets out to others, and then 
the killing starts on various fronts throughout the United States, always of federal agents, some occasionally of people who have made gun control laws. Uh, so here you have the, the get even motif. And before I evaluate that, in the case of this novel, I want to very briefly compare this with a couple of other contemporary works which you may not have heard of. There is a futuristic novel that came out about two years ago called Hear the Cradle Song by Gunnarsson. And it's set about 30 or 40 years in the future. Very briefly, it has, again, the revenge motif, but with a different kind of issue. It's about an issue that people who are not in Southern California haven't perhaps heard very much about. In the novel, the uh, illegal aliens have multiplied. They have come over the border, and they've gotten lots of free welfare, medical care, which, of course, arouses the ire of Americans because a lot of the Americans couldn't get the same thing, even though they need it just as badly. And to make a long story short, uh, in about 30 or 40 years, there is warfare between them. And you have in the conclusion of the novel, The Battle of Beverly Hills, which has, however, lost by the, uh, the Native Americans the what's done. Uh, the, the illegals win, and they take over California, which they say belonged to them already to begin with. And they did the same thing to the European whites that the European whites did to the original American Indians 100 years ago. Here was a novel of revenge, not as well written, but it's a, it's a pretty dramatic one. There was, <clears throat> but it's a revenge for a different reason, for, on a different topic. There is another novel that some of you may have heard of by the French author Jean Raspel called The Camp of the Saints. Uh, it's about the invasion of France by illegals from Algeria and then other parts of Africa and finally other parts of Asia. And it's in the end, it is a losing fight by the French citizens. They, they lose their houses, they lose their lands, most of them lose their lives, and French culture goes down the drain. This is now according to the, the author of this futuristic novel. Uh, but again, get him, violence, that's the theme. One more example of this before I return to the novel. Another book that I can't help compare with these, not a novel though, but a historical book by John Sack uh, just a couple of years ago called An Eye for an Eye. And this book, uh, it's about re revenge measures or retaliatory measures taken uh, by the inmates of Dachau and the other concentration camps in Poland when they were released by the Russians. They roam the countryside and kill anybody who is German, regardless. Uh, this is a not very well-known little piece of history, but this book documents and dramatizes it very, very well. What I'm talking about is really not that book. I want to uh, compare it, but it's, it is a tale of retaliation in the extreme. Many of the same tortures that were inflicted upon them in Dachau and other concentration camps are inflicted upon the Germans who happened to, well, who had for long, long occupied uh, East Germany and part of what was ceded to Poland in 1945 after the war. And this was done regardless really of who they were. There were many, many of them were just farmers, tradesmen, but they were killed, tortured, some of them drowned, some of them simply caged and then left to die of starvation or thirst. And this happened on a massive scale. On October 17, 1945, the president of Poland decreed that the Germans who were not already in prisons must be thrown out of Poland and all Poland administered Germany. And to the pealing of bells, the Polish police were rounded them up and herded them millions of them onto trains, enforcing the biggest migration in all human history. And Winston Churchill, in that same month, announced to the House of Commons, he said, enormous numbers of Germans are utterly unaccounted for. It is not impossible that a tragedy on a prodigious scale is unfolding itself behind the Iron Curtain. And another member of the House of Commons said, is this what our soldiers died for? 
Now you have again a massive attempt at revenge. All these are in some ways similar, but in some ways different. The justification of such retaliatory violence. First of all, against whom should it be directed? Well, as libertarians, we have one clear answer to that at any rate. Only against those who are guilty of the offense. Not against their friends, not against their relatives, not against their fellow countrymen. That's what is so distressing from our point of view about war, that in war you kill people who haven't done anything to you. I mean, the Frenchmen and German on opposite side of the trenches, each killing each other, although none has any personal grudge against the other. That represents a threat, at least to that nation, maybe not to that person. Uh, clearly the libertarian view is, if not guilty, then no action is called for. No collective punishment. No collective guilt. Collectivism of all kinds is opposed, but especially this kind of collectivism. Collectivism is still very popular. Racism is, a, is perhaps, the, as Ayn Rand said, that's, the, that's the, the worst form of collectivism. But there it is. Doing things to people because they're of a certain race, because they're of a certain nationality, because they're of a certain gender. Now, this is, to a large extent, what was done in an eye for an eye. I hadn't been aware of all those facts before. Uh, just because their nationality, they, they were Germans who had occupied with East Germany and a part of Poland after part of East Germany was ceded to Poland in 1945. Just because of their nationality, they were killed, tortured, drowned, starved in massive numbers. And mostly the Western world never heard about this. Of course, a great deal had been done to them, you see, the people who did this. They had suffered in the concentration camps and they felt that nothing, no punishment would be too great, except that they didn't always get the right people. Now, in an intended consequences, they began, sorry, by inflicting punishment only on the people who had done something, on the people who, on the regulators, on the people who were responsible for enforcing the gun laws, and sometimes on the members of the legislature who had enacted gun laws. A whole bunch of those were killed throughout the novel. They were simply wiped out. There were, and it was done with verve and enthusiasm. It was done with gusto. The author apparently also, after this listing of all the things, all the offenses by the gun enforcers, is quite obviously enthusiastic about the kind of punishment that was meted out. So anyway, so my first point is, apparently an obvious one, only the guilty deserve it, nobody else. Only those who have done it, not their fellow countrymen. Of course, there is some disagreement about who is guilty, who should be considered guilty. That is a troublesome point. I remember during my first candidacy for Libertarian Party president back in 72, my campaign manager, Dr. Jack Willis, said that anybody that's associated with the government should be killed. And I, he said, that's, that's where the libertarian principles take us. And I said, well, well here, here's the postman who delivers the mail every day. I mean, you know, you, you, you're going to kill, kill him? Yep, kill him, kill him. <laughs> That'll show them to, to work for a corrupt and evil organization like the government. That, he, he thought everyone else, including me, was very inconsistent in stopping short of this extreme measure. Uh, so, at any rate, there are differing views as to who is guilty. The next, of course, a related question is how much retaliation is called for? In Atlas Shrugged, what happens to the Oren Boyles of the world, the wicked people, who the villains of the novel? As far as I know, nothing except they're out of a job. 
I, they're not killed, they don't die as far as I know. Uh, what happens, however, in unintended consequences is much more savage. In their minds, at least, it was deserved, but pretty savage. They, the author revels in description exact, of exactly what the guns do to various parts of the victim's body uh, and extracted confessions from the federal agents before they die, things of that kind. It, the novel is uh, it's strong stuff to read when you get to those passages in the latter, latter half of the book. So, as we said, the question of how much, how much should be exacted? Again, opinions differ on that. The, some say only as much as was done in them, some an eye for an eye. Others say no, the only general principle is uh, someone of proportionality. You, the more has been done to you or yours, uh, the more you're entitled to do back to them. Uh, but it's sort of vague, and there's certainly a lot, a lot of disagreement as to the extent uh, of that. And then the final question about this I want to raise is, uh, what is the rationale for it anyway? As you may know, if you've had any course in ethics, there are different views about the justification of punishment. Not only punishment by the law, but individual punishment what, for what one person has done to another uh, outside the law. Um, the popular views today are not the views of either Ayn Rand or the author of Unintended Consequences. Popular views are sort of corrective views. The purpose of punishment is to make the person better, the person who did it, so he won't do it again. That's the clockwork orange theory. Uh, there are other, another view is deterrence. Well, we do it simply to deter other people from doing the same kind of crime. There are a lot of problems about determinants that I can't get into here. One of them is that it doesn't demand that the person be actually guilty. Deterrence can be equally effective if he's railroaded. it. And there are many other things about it, like using a person as a means to other people's end, thus violating a famous Kantian principle. Um, deterrence, in one respect, was pretty effective in unintended consequences. Uh, because at the, by the end of the novel, there's nobody who wants to be a federal agent again. <laughs> but all of these, these are in general future looking or as we call them utilitarian reasons. We should punish in order to achieve certain good effects or to avoid certain bad effects. That doesn't seem to be the operative theory in any of these novels. It, the operative theory seems to be retribution. Retribution. We punish him not in order to cause good effects. We punish him because of he has committed a crime or he's committed an evil deed and he should be punished not in order to promote some effects or because it might influence somebody else for the better, but simply because he did it. He did it and he deserves it. That's why this is called the deserts theory of punishment. theory in general is called retributivism. Ayn Rand was a retributivist and when I once mentioned to her how Immanuel Kant was the arch retributivist and I said you're you're quite Kantian Ayn and since Kant was the philosopher above all that she hated uh, she didn't exactly like this remark but it was true so she sort of let it pass. Um, at any rate Punishment is not in order to, but because of. Uh, the test, briefly, of whether you're a tributivist or not, uh, you could say, is, is this. Uh, Bertrand Russell once suggested that all killers be condemned, be shipped to some fertile South Sea island where they could easily uh, continue to exist. Uh, and then we don't have to do anything to them. We don't have to make them suffer. Why do you want them to suffer? Just, just let them do what, they, what they're what they going to do there. And when I mentioned that to Ayn Rand, she thought this was terrible. I mean, this this showed the corruptness of modern philosophy that, that a philosopher like Russell should say a thing like that. Because precisely, in her view, the idea 
was to make him atone for his deed, to make him suffer for the deed that he has committed. It wasn't in any in order to, it was strictly a because of. That also, it seems, to operate in, in the unintended consequences novel. However, there's one little problem, one little problem that has sort of haunted retributivism. It's not the fear itself, but things that it's so easy for it to get mixed up with. After uh, all, let's say, you punish him because he's done a certain deed. You punish him no more than he deserves, but you punish him by what he deserves. And now here's the problem. Consider a person who's been tortured in the Nazi concentration camps. Is that person interested in justice? Justice means getting people getting what they deserve. The desserts theory of punishment is the justice theory of punishment. Is he interested in justice or is he interested in revenge? They're very quite different things. Justice means setting things right. Getting giving each person what he or she deserves. No more, no less. Uh, revenge may know no limits and it can keep on going. A revenge against B and B revenges himself against A's relatives and A in turn on B's and so on can go forever. With justice, there, it's tried and there's a stop to it. So there's a difference, but, but it's very different, it's very difficult in an actual practical case for the person who has suffered a lot to know which it is that he or she is after. Is he's interested in justice or in revenge? Now, a person may think that what he wants is justice from someone who's done something, like murdered a member of his family, when what he really wants is just to get even. And this is very difficult to, to sort out. And people who are accustomed to being very honest with themselves and very unbiased find great difficulty with this because you can't convince them that what they really are after is justice and not just vengeance. Uh, it's difficult in practice to draw an exact line between the impulse to justice, which is impartial, and the impulse to revenge. And that's the sort of, I in general sympathize with the retributive view but it's very difficult to get this sort of thing sorted out. I could present a lot of problems and difficulties with this that I don't have time to do. I just wanted to present the view and how this turns out and what the rationale is, both in, in Ayn Rand and in Unintended Consequences. Uh, let me conclude with this. Who you want punished depends upon who your favorite enemies are, as a rule. Let me present another favorite, favorite enemy, mine. Well, there's a couple of them. And the what, question about what should be done. My own chief target of venom, when I listen to the nightly news, is, first of all, that these people don't appreciate the evil of government, the waste of government. They don't realize that, the, that if we weren't for this massive amount of waste and this massive amount of corruption, we could probably have all the things that the commentators say are either or, that is, either low taxes or uh, uh, less uh, Social Security or whatever, but not both. I suspect, I not only suspect, I'm quite sure that they would both be possible if only the, if it weren't for the tremendous bureaucratic waste and mismanagement which the public is just not aware of. I'm most aware, of, and, and so the, that's a part of the scene that you never see. The commentators don't talk about that. They say, well, it's either or, either the one or the other. What are you going to do? And I don't think it is, and the commentators are wrong. Why? I think it comes back to the educational system. Enough has been said about the corrupt system of public education. I don't need to say any more about it here. Uh, that system, however, is 
deteriorated so badly in the last 30 years that retaliatory action of some kind is called for. On the whole, that's, that's say, as in Atlas, they don't kill them, don't punish them. What you do is to just get them out of office, get rid of the huge educational bureaucracy, get rid of these people that, uh, that <coughs> demand increased uh, lobbies, doing you know, lobbying is increased every year in Sacramento and other places to require every student in college to take more education courses if she wants to be a teacher. Uh, they're useless courses and it keeps them from taking the substantive courses. Why is it? Is my, my last target is journalism. This, it's a special branch within the educational. I noted, I'm teaching at USC for 20 years, I wondered why I, I went over the records. I found that the people who did worst in my classes, regularly, year after year, were the education majors and the journalism majors. Why? Uh, they just, why did they not pass my tests? Well, they didn't have a concept in their heads. They couldn't keep two things straight, even though it would maybe be obvious to an eight-year-old and they'd still get it all mixed up. And this would make me angry, impatient. I'd called them in and they still didn't, didn't get it straight. So I thought, here, what do the, what's the typical journalism student? He comes into college. He's not particularly adept either at the sciences or the arts. And so what does he or she do? They major in journalism. They get, they learn a special language for writing in the paper called journalese. And some of them even become newscasters. They become the Dan Rathers and the Tom Brokovs of tomorrow, whom people watch avidly and think they're getting a good view of the news. Some of these newsmen are not even explicitly aware of their own status bias. They've been grown, they grew up in the welfare state. The educational system has never taught them anything about the Bill of Rights or about limited government. And so, of course, they don't pass it on. And so, thanks to these people whom millions of people in America constantly watch, the ideas that prompted the American Revolution are lost through not being mentioned. They're unbeknownst and unmourned, and most Americans never hear of it. And these are the very people whose future depends on knowledge of these very same principles. Now, what is the proper punishment for the destruction of a culture. Is it death to the traitors against liberty? Surely they have ruined more lives than most murderers have, than the gun controllers who are the special target in unintended consequences. Maybe instead of killing them, maybe they could just dig ditches are doing something useful for a living. Let them watch the news as presented by those whom they tried regularly all these years to exclude. That's not death, but something that may or may not help them at any rate. It would help us. Perhaps they deserve greater punishment than this, but I'm quite sure they don't deserve less. Thank you very much. Please, that's all the time. Are you really? Are you